Hi, I want to welcome you to another episode of Recovery Today, sponsored by the Recovery Resource Center here in Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, I'm your host, Perry Gadurgis. I'm a person in long-term recovery, which for me means I have not uh, had a drink or a drug in over 40 years. Uh, I'm also uh, a person who's worked in the treatment, prevention, and recovery community for 40 years or so, and professionally here in Maryland. Um, this show explores different aspects around addiction and recovery and co-occurring issues and uh, the different diverse ways that people choose a pathway of recovery. And that also means not just the individual that's directly impacted, but actually other folks are directly impacted as well, including parents, family members, uh, our community, coworkers, close friends, siblings, and so uh, our show today is going to explore that a little bit deeper. I, I, I like to hope that we will do that today for you. Our guest today is Nancy Mitchell, who is our uh, recently uh, appointed uh, Poet Laureate here in Salisbury, Maryland, and uh, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Perry. I'm really thrilled to be here. This is a wonderful thing that you're doing and opening doors for people and opening minds. So I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, Nancy, um, what is your sort of bio? I, I thought to have you share a little bit about your sure. first your, your professional bio and, okay. and how that and yeah. what that is. Well, I taught at uh, Salisbury University for 16 years in the creative writing department. Okay. And I have three books of poetry out, and I've edited some interviews. I work for Plume Poetry. It's an online journal, very good, and. Um, Right now, and I've been working for CELL, a uh, Center for Extended and Lifelong Learning at SU, with different workshops for basically people who have more time on their hands, sometimes retired folks, or doing retreats. So uh, that's what I'm doing lately. And my, I'm the Pioneer Poet Laureate, the first one. So I'm busy trying to find a way that I can be an ambassador for poetry in Salisbury, so yeah. Well, on that note, for uh, the benefit of our, uh, our viewers and uh, Folks, what actually is a Poet Laureate? Well, Poet Laureate typically was tasked with writing poems for certain important city events in the traditional sense. But what every Poet Laureate uh, likes to do or hopes to do is they have a certain platform. Uh, Joy Harjo now, she's a Native American, she was just appointed Poet Laureate of the United States. and. Her platform is going to be raising awareness of uh, indigenous people in our country. And my platform is to raise awareness of poetry in our city and also raise awareness of our city and the beauty here and the places that we share, the shared spaces, where we come together, like in downtown Salisbury, at the folk festival, the mural that uh, Sketch Boyd is, is right now is executing and I'll be reading a poem at that presentation too and I, I just I think come together is my thing Rumi said beyond all ideas of wrongdoing and right doing there is a field I'll meet you there so I want poetry to be the field where we can all meet so I'm celebrating it asking for poems and interacting through the language of poetry with the with the citizens of our our city and county so, yeah. Yeah, what you're talking about is uh, a sense of community and connectedness. Oh, absolutely. And, and even in the word community, unity, yes. as it were, yes. and, and, and the connectiveness as it is. Yeah. So the, the reason I have you as a guest and people who are watching this show might say, well, what's a poet supposed to be talking about addiction or recovery? Well, Nancy has some rich experience with that both uh, personally, and I'd yes. like you to talk about yes. that in just a moment, but for our viewers, just to know that uh, if you yourself have suffered from addiction or a co-occurring mental health challenge or as a family member, that there is a real power in writing and 
and also reading other people's writing, whether it's, it is poetry that relates to addiction or memoirs that mm -hmm. uh, uh, relate to uh, recovery stories, as it were. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, so what is your, like, your own personal connection to recovery, your, your own? Well, I have a, a family member who's been in recovery for 20 years, and mm -hmm. I come from a, a genetic heritage of, uh, of addiction and alcoholism. So uh, my, my family member went through recovery. He was in college. I'm going to slip with pronouns here. <laughs> but he was uh, in college. And you know, uh, I know every parent can identify with this. You know something's wrong. You know, I had dreams. He would come home, and I'll read a poem about this, come home for Christmas, and he would always start getting sick every Christmas. You know, and it was because he promised not to be using anywhere near me, and he held off as long as he could. Okay. But it was just this sense of what's going on, what is happening here. And finally, he did come out, and you know, the suffering from the guilt, oh my gosh, it's my fault. How could my, my child who left without a cavity have be in this, the shame, that, the, the shame of addiction that keeps so many people from seeking help or reaching out, which is really a, a horrible, horrible thing that other people take advantage of, the vulnerabilities of people who suffer from this genetic predisposition. So um, he ended up going to Hazelden in Minnesota, which is fabulous, who's the first recovery center in the country. And uh, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. My husband and I went for a week. It's called Family Program. I was totally blown away, and everyone there, even the, the people who cook, every single person there is in recovery, and the love there is so palpable. We were afraid we'd, you know, when we came back to Salisbury, we'd be our snarky selves again, which we were in due time. <laughs> but, you know, I think, so when I came back, I thought, you know, what I want to commit to is bringing addiction out of the shadow of shame, and every disorder out of the shadow of shame because that's where it grows bigger and darker. When you shine the light on it, it shrinks and it makes it manageable. So that's, I think, and this show does this. I want there to be 4K runs. I know we we're talking about in Minnesota, they do. They're just an incredibly advanced uh, culture in Minnesota and they, they have runs, they have festivals, they they're integrated into the community. And I think shows like this integrate those suffering from addiction, those in recovery, those who suffer because their beloved suffer, and we suffer terribly. And I think um, for, you, for people to be able to reach out, my, this book, Grief Hut, was uh, a book that I wrote about uh, the experience of my son coming out, his recovery, and the other side of it. And at first, uh, you know, my family was not really happy about this. It was you're exposing family secrets. There was a, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of chilling from my, my family members, not all of them, my siblings, like how, how this is in such bad taste, how can you do this? But every time I gave a reading from this book, people came up to me and said, you've told my story. I'm going to stop say I'm going to stop lying about this and people went into recovery and I'm friends with them now but they said you gave me the courage so that did I want it did I choose to write about these things not really you know it was something that I was encumbered with in a sense and I I've studied literature all my life and I've studied uh Jungian psychology, and I do know that when you're able to articulate something, it's not cathartic, as people say, it's cathartic getting it off your chest. It's transformative, because what you're able to do is take that experience and turn it into something else, which in turn will be an experience for someone else. It becomes a sublime thing. That's why if you stand in front of a work of art or read something or go to a movie and you're not the same person, when you come away from that, that you were when you went in, you've undergone the transformation. And so I knew that this was a transformative book for other people. I had to bear, the, bear that, you know, scrutiny from my colleagues, from my family, 
of how dare you write about this stuff, had really in bad taste, or how dare you? And I thought, you know, I'm just going to stand here and do it because, as my son said, Mom, I ask his permission. None of these were published. This book would not have been published if I didn't have his permission. I showed him the poems. He said, Mom, tell it true and tell it all. Maybe we can help somebody. So, you know. Awesome. Yeah. He's been well, great. Can you, can you share um, one or two yes, right I now? Yes, I would. Here? This is um, when, you know, the early uh, stages, and, you know, every parent who's been through this or every wife who's been through this has been, um, you know, had that feeling of, I know something's wrong, but then you try to ask, and it's like, no, no, no. So this is about the early, okay. the years, years of it. Only lightly you let me touch your skin. Jesus, how thin. Trace ribs in relief the raised ridge of your spine, as if from this outline alone I could divine this trouble that finds us here. You curled toward the wall, shaking under two down comforters, thermostat up to 80. My pleading, please, please see a doctor, please, and you, take it easy, Ma. There's nothing anyone can do. It's just the flu. While all along, track marks were lying in the blue of your tattoos. Wow. Yeah. So, <laughs> 20 years, and it's still very moving. <laughs> yes. So this is after the... Um, after he went to recovery, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with this, the apartment he was staying in was just horrible, you know, it was just a disaster and we, my husband went and packed everything in these black trash bags and so when I could do this, I backed the car out and I put a tarp down to go through it. So this is about the, okay. the process and it's called Saved. I backed both cars out and spread a tarp over the garage floor, then dumped out the black trash bags hauled from your rented room, except for the two you took on the plane. Pawn notes for my gifts, folded into broken-winged origami birds, powdery pill cutters, flame smudge spoons, resin clogged glass pipes, empty vi volume vials, bank, bank statements, ATM hits over 200 a day. Plastic phone shells, wire guts twisted into a ball, a t-shirt swears, hoilude rules, and then a page with goals marked in red, rubber banded around a St. Jude's prayer card. To get sober, to paint, for some woman to love me. One pile I'll save, one pile I'll throw away. The other pile I'll smash into bits and burn. So those were the those early days, you know, of and he was there for five months. And of most of the fellows in the dorm with him, he and one other person are still alive because they went back to their old their old life and it was waiting for them. It was very hard very, very hard, and at, at Hazelden it's an um, amazing program in that they pair you, you go for family program, they pair you with someone who has the same addiction as your beloved, but not with your beloved. And you can ask questions, you know, and you can say, why, why would you ever do that to your mother? Yeah. And this fellow that I was with, a fabulous, fabulous man said, I never knew my mom felt it felt like the way you did until you said that. So there were a lot of tears and breakthroughs and just, you know, seeing, see, being able to see another person and see my, my son and for him to be able to see me and see his mother and the suffering. And at the end of the family program, he, there's a ceremony and he gave me a medallion and unfortunately he's not with us anymore he was one of the people that went back home and but I treasure that connection with him it opened up it put a human face on this for me because I was you know I was like everybody else like you had the best how could you do this how could you do this to me it was so egotistical it's not about me it's about the disease 
No one was doing this to me. My son had a very serious disease and we haven't ever been able to move out of that and we recently have because it's affecting segments of the population that are powerful. But for years disenfranchised people never had a voice. They were, you know, they were bums, they were on the side of the road, they, they were throwaway people. And now because of this awareness and so many people who have means, this is coming to light. So, you know, I'm just so grateful for your community, for this opportunity. And I, as a, as a writer, I, I you know, would, would like to welcome any kind of workshops people would ever like to do to work through this, because I can, A, teach them about poetry and teach them how to write poetry, because everyone can write poetry, really. You take an abstraction, and you tether it to your experience, so. Well, speaking yeah. of that, I guess is that, because I was looking forward to, to this interview yeah. for quite a while now, Me and too. have known you for a little while mm -hmm. in your work, and um, as you just described, that anyone can write a poem, um, mm -hmm. and yet so many people, including myself in the past, have been intimidated yes. or not worthy or the rules as right, they were. Right. And so I wanted to share a brief story where uh, when I, in the year before I got in recovery myself, I was in jail, I was in there for an $8 armed robbery, I got eight years. It transformed my life as a teenager oh uh, in, 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 teenager. Prince George, yeah, in Prince George's County, mm -hmm. Maryland. And what happened was um, while in jail, I somehow started writing, well I wrote a lot of letters to my parents and to mm -hmm. my sister and to other friends. But then I had an opportunity to write a poem because we had a jail newspaper. And it was called The Centennial Slammer. And this was 1977. And the first poem I ever wrote, and I read this at occasional events, and, it, and the poem is called Killer Wheat. Mm -hmm. And the poem goes, there's a, um, there's a high... And yourself giving the reading at, when you've read it before. And you can get right back there. There's a high known as Killer Wheat, but you can call it green, angel dust, or PCP. The high hits you as fast as a train, but if you keep smoking it, it's gonna burn out your brain. And if you keep making those KW sales, all you're gonna do is wind up in jail. And if you think this is all a big joke, then die as you take your last toke. Wow, that's lovely, that's great. So I wrote that, and I still was smoking PCP in uh -huh. prison, in jail, uh, for another year. Mm -hmm. And, and hindsight, I look at how I was trying to reach for some recovery and what mm -hmm. those words were yes, talking absolutely. about. Yeah. There was a hope, a reach. I saw the destructive nature of it around my peers, my sister who ended up committing suicide a year later and really f truly pushed me into recovery myself. But that, that was just my own sort of worded effort to, to make some connection with something that was mm -hmm. killing me. Mm -hmm and, and maybe a glimmer of hope that something could be different, well, an alternative. A, there was a self-awareness. You know, it, you didn't have the self-awareness until you wrote the poem. It's so interesting, the places that poetry will take you. I mean, you don't even know what the poem is trying to tell you until you've finished it. And it's like, okay, I know I have this awareness now of what you have to do to start changing. And it's, it's fascinating to me. It's very transformative. I think, I think poetry is almost like a prayer sometimes. And it's a spiritual practice. For me, it's a spiritual practice. And um, I just think of how the, uh, and leading into that recently, more recently, there was a hiatus between this kind of writing and um, things were going along much better. But more recently, I was doing a, I was asked to do a creative writing workshop, and it was for on grieving. And I really thought, okay, here we go. It's going to be. It was an old. I thought typically these the folks in my workshops were older. It turned out I thought they'd be widows and widowers. It turned out they were parents grieving the death of their children to the opioid crisis. And I was amazed at how many people were saying, my kid didn't start out being a partier. They had a disorder. One, one uh, woman's child had the, dis 
this disorder where he could never assimilate emotion, particularly joy, and it made him go into a rage. And it wasn't until he was 13 and had was giving Oxycontin for the, the pain of an abscessed tooth that they quit. So suddenly their family had this time together without this child making it hell. But then when, you know, the opioids were pulled back, he was on the street, like so many people end up on the street. And these parents wanted me to know, my kid was a good kid. They didn't start out like this. You know, and that's where, you know, we get to who's culpable for this. Who knew this? And as we were talking before so many times, the very people who pushed the opioids and pushed doctors to prescribe them are also the people opening up the recovery centers. So it's just this sort of big, you know, constant money machine that grinds up the lives of others. And I just think, so I wrote a poem about it. I had seen a prompt for a contest and all of a sudden all their stories came out in this poem. And it's written from the persona of a young man. And I took it in and I said, I'm not gonna enter this contest. And I read it to them and they said, tell it. Again, mm -hmm. tell it you speak for us, you speak for us. So I thought, I will, I'll speak for people who can't speak. They wrote wonderful poems, but they really wanted me to have a platform for that. Tell it, tell people my, my kid was a good kid. You know, he or she wasn't a criminal. And it was so moving to hear these stories and to know that because of their shame, I mean, all of them said, I never knew where to turn. And I think the 12-step programs are so valuable, like Al-Anon is amazing, I think, because we're working in Al-Anon, we work steps because we have to recover from being codependent because addiction's a family disease. Everyone's involved. You can't pretend not. And you can't hide them in the closet. You know, it's like, it's a disease. You know, it's not yes. a moral yeah. failing. People are hurting and they want relief, whether they're hurting physically or emotionally, they want relief. And you ask anybody after a week of work why they're going to happy hour, okay? It's the same thing. Yeah. But it's because of this genetic predisposition, happy hour goes on until, you know, these people are very, very sick and there we're community, you know, we have to scaffold, get under this and be helpful. So Absolutely. That's my... And, and what about that poem then? Can you read that now? I uh, would be happy to read it. Because we're starting to wrap up. Yes, this okay, time. It's I will. It's just gone by really It has, fast. it's been great. It's very powerful. Uh, it's called Black Bittern. Uh, Black Bittern is a bird and it's, um, so that's the title of it and you'll see why. This. It's, this is in the uh, persona of the voice of a young man. Okay. I always reacted, reacted bad to happy. I crushed it when I could, like a lame bird gimping under my work boot. At two, I chucked a metal Tonka truck into the TV to shut my sister's singing to Big Bird on Sesame Street. I drove my fist into the cake my mom made for my fifth birthday. A tiny silver plane pulled my name in blue across a fluffy field of white icing. Her face, too much pretty and I'd shake with rage. I had to smash things up. Bad tooth abscess at 13, Oxycontin for the pain, and lo and behold, it tamped that demon down. Drove that beast into a cave, kept it at bay. But the price for peace a man is made to pay gerbil wheel of scoring, dealing, jail, rehab. I had a rope tattooed around my neck for every year. Yet last stint in the big house, the fits just quit. I got out, stayed clean, went to AA, the tech for a welding degree, met Katie and bam, the kid. One year and I can breathe. Until today, my birthday, we came to camp by the river to celebrate. I was splitting firewood and there was Katie, our baby at her tit, haloed with a golden shaft of light beaming through the pin oak trees. 
and I could feel the old gear ratchet up in my gut, and I was itching to hit something, or worse, the hatchet so heavy in my hand. I told her I had to piss, then dove for the double dose of gray death and work stashed up under the truck. You see, I had to. When my boy was born, I put one hand on his head and the other on my heart, and I swore if I ever had one thought of hurting him, I'd do myself in, then and there. So here I am, hunkered down on a tree stump, suck, sunk in mud muck and reeds. When the tide turns, I'll punch the needle in, and by the time I'm good and gone, the road current will sweep me clean away. And my poor sweet Katie girl back at that picnic table with the cake, the candles waiting to be lit. I guess the sole witness to the only vow I've ever made, much less ever kept, is that black bittern overhead circling back to her nest. So. Wow. I've heard you read that a couple yeah. of times, and every mm -hmm. time I get chills, yeah, and I just got chills there. It, yeah. as you said earlier, the, the these move us and touch us and well, change us, and and you know what's interesting about it is that a lot of people uh, have have said, "Gosh, but you know, he does himself in. How can?" But the nobility of making that promise. I mean, there's some things that are, you know. He knew if this started up again, he'd start up again, and he could not bear to put his family through this. So the one thing that he loved more than anything, he made a vow. So it's very, I mean, his psychology is skewed, but there's something about this confession that moves me, and it's one of the few poems that actually have come to me very easily mm -hmm. and inspired, and it's written in the voice of a, a young man. It's not coming from me. So you know how that can be with art. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes yes. it you're the reed that the wind blows through. So and so yeah. So as we're wrapping up now. Yeah. What is there a, uh, one last thing you might want to share with our uh, viewers, our community um, that maybe is still struggling or suffering from this disease oh, of yes. addiction? I, um, what would you last like uh, I, folks I would to say hear? There are people there. Don't let pride get in your way. I know that just like, you know, it's interesting because everyone says you have to hit rock bottom for, uh, for people that have addiction issues to start to recover. Well, I think family members have to hit rock bottom where they cannot get up anymore and then they find themselves in an Al-Anon meeting. And I'm not saying Al-Anon is the one way, but there, look at this community. If they hear this, they know they can reach out without judgment. And I would say, understand that it's a very complicated disease because there, there you know, are so many levels of codependency. But if you're healthy, the healthier you try to get, you pull the others along with you. And it, it's reach out to others who are farther along on the road to recovery because as family members, we're recovering. So reach out. Don't be afraid, and I am, you know, offering to give writing workshops to people who would like to come together as a group and work with me because I think that it's very interesting what that kind of uh, finding articulation, as Shakespeare says, give sorrow words or, you know, your heart will break. Give sorrow words. Give sorrow words. And he certainly knew what he was talking about. So you can transform that. Someone else may run across that and say, you transform me to, to take the next step. So, and we can do it together. That's the thing. But in the shadow of shame, there's no way to reach anybody. So, you know, it's like, I wanna see that, you know, 4K, 10K, 5K, you know, run down the streets of our city for addiction, for the disease of addiction. So that's, I'm the ambassador of poetry for Salisbury. So that's one of the things that I'm, I'm uh, an ambassador for too, so. Wow, and, and really on that positive note, you're, 
this, the whole idea of the celebration of recovery and its possibilities, oh, like your son and so many people, this is a treatable disease and people you don't have to die from it yes, or their families you. have and, to die from it. And your gratitude has inspired you to do all of your work. And I don't know if we have time for a tiny, the, a hopeful poem. Um, yeah, I think uh, let's okay. end with This was poem. at the end of um, when my son had had some years under his belt and I had come back and, you know, started looking at things differently. And I realized that every single moment is our gift, is, is the presence, is the most important and the only thing we have. So I started seeing things differently and I wrote this poem. Holy the holly tree, its leaves prickly sheen. Holy the husband jangling his keys. Holy the thud of wood upon wood, wind worrying water from shore to pond shore. Holy the equivocator's decision to lie. Holy the mechanic whose dog has died. The pines intertwined with the pin oak vine. Holy the leaky rowboat's green algae growth lashed to the dock with a fraying rope. Holy the hill, the canoe belly up. Wow. So, yeah, there's another side. There's another side. Well, thank you thank again. Thank you. It was lovely. Thank you so much, Perry, for having me. The pleasure's mine. And I just want to remind people that reach out, reach out, and reach out because help is there. So, thank you so much. I want to thank you again for watching another episode of Recovery Today, again sponsored by the Recovery Resource Center here in Salisbury, Maryland. It offers a lot of resources and support for individuals suffering from addiction uh, and their family members as well. Um, I would hope that you can share this as well, that th we uh, have this show on the PAC-14 uh, YouTube channel. And I usually people watch these kind of shows and say, oh, wow, I wish so-and-so could watch this. So uh, please share this show, as it were. And um, one last signature is to say that Nancy has so reminded us that recovery is a process. It's not so much an event, but that ultimately recovery is possible and it's possible for anyone. So thanks for watching.